rest in your embrace in this time, in this Good morning. Well, it's good to see you guys here this morning. Thank you for joining us today. Church, why are we here? That's right. We are here to worship. And church, who are we here for? We're here for each other. Yeah, we're here to minister to each other, to encourage each other. And let me just tell you, today is going to be an encouraging day. I'm so excited to have my new friend, Preston Condra, here with us. Preston is the founder and president of Sufficient Word Ministries, and uh, he is here today to talk to us and to encourage us in evangelism. As you know, we've been talking about, thinking about, digging into Scripture to see, to be reminded of our personal responsibility to take the gospel to the neighborhoods and the nations, starting right here at home, one life at a time. And I know that uh, you're going to be encouraged today. We do have a, a workshop after the service today that Preston is going to lead. Um, and just uh, the, the title of the workshop is, Can I Ask You a Question? And it's going to be how to engage, how to answer questions that might come up as we share our faith. So I know that you are going to be encouraged today. So thank you for being here. Those of you watching online, for whatever reason, we're, we're grateful you're connecting with us that way. But let me just tell you, it's better to be here, all right? So uh, if, 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 you're, if you're connecting and you're out of town or something like that, look, however you're connecting, we're great with that. But we would love to have you here because, again, to encourage each other, to build each other up, we need each other. We need these relationships. Um, so let's do this. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. Now let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Let's be reminded... Of of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And, uh, and let's be encouraged in that way. Let's, let's pray together. Father God, we are grateful for your goodness toward us, your goodness to us. Thank you for Jesus. Or we know that Jesus is the name above all names because he's the only name that can save. And so, Father, I pray that today you would motivate all of us. Lord, help us to, to get out of the box of our understanding of what 
evangelism is. Help us, Lord, just to be reminded that it is, it is sharing your goodness, what you've done in our lives. Lord, I pray for Preston today as he brings the word and as he encourages us. Lord, I pray you would give him the words to say, just wake up, Lord, the Holy Spirit that was in that is in him. We know that he walks with you. And so, Lord, just fill him with your spirit. Fill us with your spirit as we hear. And help us, Lord, to be about your work. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing this morning hymns about the joy of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's sing together. I found a friend who is all to me. His love is
children make their way front for our children's sermon. Let's stand together and have a time of welcome. Make those around you feel welcome this morning. Thank you. You can make your way back to your seats and have a seat. All right, guys. Somebody tell me what we're celebrating this week. Valentine's Day. Very good. And I asked a couple of the girls to bring... We're having a Valentine's party. Cool. I asked a couple of girls to bring teddy bears up this morning because we are collecting new teddy bears for the Child Advocacy Center um, all through the month of February. So if you want to bring those... The uh, kids ministry is heading that up and we are collecting them through the month of february and there's a box out in the gathering area where you can drop those thank you girls let me set those over here for you as a reminder all right so valentine's day is this week anybody know what these are anybody ever had these before conversation hearts yeah and they all have little things on them if i could read them i can tell you what they say uh, let's say, I like you, giggle, bestie, um, XOXO, you're my friend, all kinds of cool things they say on those. Well, in a minute we can have some. But so people, maybe they give those out for Valentine's, or maybe um, you buy somebody a bear. Anybody ever gotten a bear for Valentine's Day, a stuffed animal? Or what else can you get for Valentine's Day? Hey guys, come on back over here. Henry, come back over here. What else can you get for Valentine's Day? Heart plushies, yeah, that's good. What else, Olivia? Um, 
You had to pick a Valentine. Okay. All right. So what did Miss Ashley give you all in Sunday school this morning that had you all all hyped up? Chocolate, right? So chocolate's a big thing that goes on on, sun, on a Valentine's Day too, right? Or maybe you go out somewhere special for dinner or make a special dinner for somebody. Um, or maybe you write a love letter. Anybody ever written a love letter? What? Nobody's ever written a love letter? Well, you know what? God has written a love letter to us. You know what it is? He sent his son, but you know what the love letter to us is? It's the Bible. Everything he wrote in the Bible is a love letter to us to let us know how much he loves us. Hold on just a second, Olivia. Let us know how much he loves us, and um, he does everything for us. And so he's written us a love letter. And he tells us in the Bible that we can love others because he's loved us. Because God is love, and that's where we get love from and how we're able to love others. You know, God loves us even when we mess up, even when we do things we're not supposed to do. He still loves us. Do we love people like that all the time? If somebody messes up or acts up or does something to us, we're supposed to love them, aren't we? Why? We're supposed to love them because God shows us his love. He showed us how to love. Um, he loves us when we do that. So this week, think about that as we celebrate Valentine's. Think about um, how we can love others like God loves us. Olivia, what you want to say? Man? Mm-hmm. We'll pray for him, okay? All right, let's pray together this morning. Lord, thank you that you love us, and Lord, that you show us how to love others, that we can love others. Lord, even sometimes when it's hard, because we know that you love us, even when we do things we're not supposed to do, um, even when we fail, you still love us. And help us to love each other that way this week, and to share that love. In Jesus' name, amen. sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I have preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken their stand. By this gospel, you are saved and is hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain, for which I have received, I have passed on to you for the first importance, that Christ died for our sins and according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Please bow your heads for um, prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for dying on the cross and raising from the dead on the third day. Thank you for our church and this time we are where we can grow closer to you. Help us listen to what you say to us today and be obedient to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, like I told a few people this morning, me and Charlotte are back from the mission field of St. Lucia. And, um, but no, it, it's, uh, I'm kidding, but obviously, but, um, just like these, um, it says out here in the hall, you know, when we leave here, we're entering the mission field and God actually gave us a few opportunities to have some faith conversations, even while we were, um, enjoying some time and down there and, one of them with our, and this is going to sound bad, our butler. Um, we, had a, we had a butler, a group of butlers that, you know, if you wanted room service or whatever. So, yeah, we were really struggling. And, um, but, no, it was neat. We, the, the last day, they're getting our luggage out of our room and all that and uh, had him come in. And, and he's, even he brought up, he said, man, I think we ought to pray. And I was like, man, let's do that. And so sat there in our room um, together and uh, just, just prayed and blessings over him and his family. And, um, and he had a few requests for us to continually pray for him. And um, it was just, just a neat time to see, a good way to cap off the trip. And, uh, but just a great reminder that wherever we are, we are there to tell those that we come in contact with about the amazing grace of Jesus. Amen. Sing this with us. Put 
your hand together.
Good morning. How many of you are here this morning? All right. It is a pleasure to be here. Fred, thanks so much for having me. By the way, it's a good man right there, Fred Shackelford. Privileged to call him a friend. So it is a pleasure to get to be here with you. Let me tell you about our ministry. My wife and I have a ministry called Sufficient Word Ministries. We're based out of Springdale, Arkansas. Okay, don't hold it against me that I'm a Hogs fan, all right? Uh, yeah, go Hogs, Pig Suey, yeah. That's right. I, and I was, in, uh, I was in Lynn Butler's office right before church, and he has an Arkansas Razorbacks display. And I got to tell you, that really warmed my heart. It really did. 
felt like I was right at home. So it is a pleasure to be here with you. Let me tell you about our ministry. Our website is, if you want to take notes and look at it later, it's www.666.com. Uh, no, wait a minute. No, that's not it. I'm just kidding. No, it's sufficientword.com. You can, I don't know what you'll find at 666, all right? Don't go there, all right? No, you can, you can find our website there. Our materials, our books are on there. You can also get in touch with us uh, from the website. Also, if you're a Facebook person, we're on Facebook. Check out our Facebook page and give us a like if you can. On our website, you'll see some, you'll see our books on available there as well as you can order them on uh, Amazon and in bookstores as well. The one we're going to really look at today, and by the way, I have these on our table too and over where we'll have lunch and the training. The one we're going to look at today and you can get a copy of is Can I Ask You a Question? It's a handbook for helping you confidently share your faith. I'll tell you more about that. It'll be a part of the, the training we'll do uh, this afternoon with lunch. Look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. You know, today we're going to solve three fears. Now think about yourself. If you're a, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, when it comes to witnessing, when it comes to trying to share the gospel with people, do you have one or all of these fears? Now, these are fears I've had through the years, okay? Um, I don't know what to say. How many of you have that's a fear you have when it comes to witnessing to people? I just don't know what to say. How many of you have that fear, okay? How about this one? I'm afraid to offend. Or number three, I'm afraid I can't answer someone's objections to the gospel. How many of you have had one or all of those fears? Okay, we're going to solve those today, all right? In fact, we're going to solve them in a way that I'm going to show you that you'll be able to remember, that you'll be able to use, that feels normal to you in conversation with people, okay? So we're going to, let's, let's set off to solve those three fears. Let's start with that first one. That's the one we want to solve this morning. I don't know what to say. Uh, to solve that fear, first of all, you've got to know the gospel well, right? We've got to know the message that we need to present to folks well so that we know what to say. Well, here it is right here, 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verses 1 through 4 here. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. I call this the gospel passage because of that statement right there, the gospel. In fact, if you write in your Bible, underline that, the gospel, which I preached unto you. This is the gospel Paul preached which also you have received and wherein you stand. We'll come back to those words received and stand in a minute. Verse 2, by which also you are saved. Boy, that's an important statement. Underline that in your Bible if you write in your Bible. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. We'll come back to those statements in a minute as well. Verse 3, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Okay, here it is. Here is the saving gospel message in verses 3 and 4. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You know, when we talk about preaching the gospel or sharing the gospel, this is what we're talking about when we say that. There's one place in the Bible where the gospel is called the gospel, and it's stated fully, succinctly in one passage, and it's right here in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. This is the place where it's stated. This is how we know what the gospel is, also what it's not, right? So when it comes to witnessing to people, it is hugely important that we are familiar with what the gospel actually is. Hey, look over in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul, the apostle, actually references that gospel there in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, right over here in Romans 1, 16. I'm sure this is a familiar verse to you. Romans 1, 16, but hold your finger in 1 Corinthians 15, all right? We're going to come back to that. Romans 1, verse 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it... Now, when he says it there, what's he referring back to? The gospel of Christ. That's right. Keep that in mind here, okay? For it, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone. Now, if Paul stopped right there, if that was the end of the sentence there, that'd mean everyone's going to heaven, wouldn't it? But look what he says. 
to everyone that believes. Now, the implication there is everyone that believes it, the gospel of Christ, right? To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Notice the three things we learn here. First of all, Paul gives us the name or the title of that saving gospel message over in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It's the gospel of Christ. And then he tells us that it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation simply by believing it to everyone who believes it. And what does everyone mean there? When he says everyone, who's left out of everyone? No one. Anyone and everyone who believes in the gospel of Christ will have the power of God unto salvation. They'll have salvation, they'll have the forgiveness of sins. Everyone. And in case there's any question about what he means about everyone, look what he says. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. That means to the Jew and the non-Jew. The invitation is open to everyone to believe. And everyone who does believe will have the power of God unto salvation. Now, Here's what you believe. You believe that what Jesus did on the cross, his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, that that is enough by itself to give you the forgiveness of sins. Notice how we see that because there's nothing else in here that's stated that can save you. So we know that it's what Jesus did, and it's a question of do you believe it's enough or not, right? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. What's that word gospel mean? Do you remember? Good news. That's right. It is news. It's a message. And notice a couple of things about this gospel message. It is a message to be believed, right? We see that here in the passage. We saw that in Romans 116. But since it's a message, also what's assumed here is that the message is communicated, that it's delivered as well. That is a natural part of what a message is. So it's a message to be believed, but it's also a message to be delivered. And notice too what he says, because we see that it's a message to be delivered specifically when he says that this is the gospel that I preached to you. So we know it's to be communicated to the world. And notice, too, Paul says this is the gospel not only that he preached, but that you, the Corinthian, the believers at Corinth there, you have received. That word received in the, in the Greek, in the original, now I'm not a Greek scholar, I just looked it up, okay? That word received in the Greek means to accept. So Paul says this is the gospel that I preached to you that you accepted right? And then also he says, this is also wherein you stand. Boy, I love that word stand in the Greek. You know what I like reading? I I read the King James a lot. You you know what ends up happening when I read the King James? I have to stop and look up words. Do you, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm from Arkansas, so I'm naturally a little bit slower than everybody else, right? So, uh, I, I, I want to read the King James because it slows me down some. And I end up stopping and doing word studies. And boy, I'll tell you, the, the words in God's word are just so rich. And this is one of them right here when it says stand. That word stand means to stabilize. Now, here's what he's saying. This is the gospel you accepted that I preach to you that you, you've accepted where you can find stability. Isn't it amazing, folks, that, that God could have done something 2,000 years ago, Jesus' death on the cross and his burial and his resurrection, and that paid for all sin. And all we have to do is believe that what was done there is enough to pay for my sins and give me the forgiveness of God, God would then give me that forgiveness and a right standing with him, and he would deposit into my account his righteousness and give me hope. I have the forgiveness of sins. Isn't it amazing that an act done 2,000 years ago has that kind of power? And not only that, 
but wherein as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I can have stability. You know what stability means? That I'm free. You know what our three enemies are in the Bible? The world, the flesh, and the devil. And you know, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're actually free from those enemies. What does that mean? That means you don't have to yield to them anymore. The unbeliever does not have that option. You can instead yield to the Lord and not to the temptation of your flesh or to the temptation or the fear from the enemy or from the temptation of the world. Now that, that folks is real power, but that's really good news too. You see the The power of the gospel doesn't just end when we believe it and we get the forgiveness of God, the power of God unto salvation. Oh, no, no, it's beyond that. We can also find stability there. And so Paul is reminding the believers of that here in the church of Corinth. And if you've read the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians, they certainly needed to be reminded of that. So the Corinthians accepted this message Paul preached to them this gospel message, and it's believing that message that saved them, but also where they could find stability. Now look at verse 2. We see here that it's believing the gospel message that saves. Look what he says there, verse 2, by which also you are saved. Now when he says by which, what's he referring back to? The gospel, that's right. That Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. That's by which you are saved. You believe that message, that what he did is enough, and you are saved. We're saved by believing the gospel message. But, and then he goes into a couple of what I call qualifying statements. He says, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So verse 1 tells us the gospel, what the gospel is. Verse 2 tells us it's believing the gospel message that saves. He says it right there, by which you were saved. It's a saving message. And then he says, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Let's talk about that keep in memory for a minute. That word keep in the, in the Greek means to grasp or to hold. It's what we might call the grasping a concept, Right? In other words, Paul's saying this is the gospel you accepted where you can find stability unless you didn't understand, right? Let me illustrate this keeping in memory here. It's remembering. Your version may say remembering. It's literally to hold in memory. And that's what we do when we remember something. We hold it in our memory. But here's how it happens. Let me illustrate for you. How many of you remember that 2 plus 2 equals 4? Well, not all of you, but most of you. Uh, Man, I asked that in Louisiana. Nobody raises their hands. It goes right over their heads. I'm just kidding, kind (laughs) of. I love to tease my friends in Louisiana, all right? Now, you can remember, you can hold in your memory that 2 plus 2 equals 4 because you grasp the concept, right? That $2 plus $2 more equals $4, So Paul's saying, this is a gospel message you accepted where you can find stability unless you didn't grasp it. Why does he bring this up here? It's important. If it's stated in Scripture, it's important. But why is this here? Because understanding the message is a prerequisite to believing it. you got to understand as an unbeliever that you're a sinner and you're in need of a Savior. Right? So if someone says they believe the gospel but can't tell you what it actually is, they probably don't understand it. You know what else that means for us as, as witnesses in, in our witnessing as, as Christians? That we're clear on what the gospel is. That we slow down, we take our time, and we be sure they understand and that their questions are answered. Right? So that they understand and can therefore believe. Then the next qualifying statement, he says, unless you have believed in vain. In vain there means without purpose or without success. That's what that word means in the Greek. How does that happen? How does someone believe in vain, believe without success when it comes to believing the gospel message? Well, it happens in three ways, actually. A person can believe with an incorrect purpose, a 
person can believe that the gospel is insufficient to save, in other words, that it's not enough, a person can put their faith in an incorrect object. Let's talk about that first one for a minute. How does a person believe with an incorrect purpose? Well, let's back up. What's the correct purpose for believing the gospel message? It's for the purpose of salvation, right? So how does someone believe with an incorrect purpose? Well, here's how it happens. A person can believe that Jesus really lived and died and rose again. They just don't believe there's salvation in that. You see the difference? The gospel is not just only a historic message. Oh, it is. Jesus really did live. He was a real person in history. He really did physically, bodily die on the cross. He really did physically, bodily rise from the dead. He's a real person in history. But folks, the message here of his death, burial, and resurrection is also where salvation is found. There's a difference between believing in just the historicity and believing that the message has, is, 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 can save you, right? You see the difference? It's all in the purpose for which you believe. So a person can believe in vain by believing with the wrong purpose. Here's another way believing in vain happens, believing that the gospel is insufficient to save. Boy, this is a crucial point. It really is. What is it, how, does it, how does that happen? How does a person believe in vain this way? Well, it's when you add something to the gospel message, like water baptism, for example. You know, when you add something to the gospel message, a couple of things happen. First is your faith actually is in that which you add to the gospel and not the gospel itself, right? When you add water baptism, for example, people add a whole host of things to the gospel, But water baptism is a big one, right? When you add water baptism to the gospel, people say you got to be baptized in water to be saved. Some will go so far as to even say, well, you got to be baptized in our church even to be saved, right? When you add water baptism to the gospel message, your faith's actually in H2O and not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, right? Here's the other part of adding something to the gospel message, and this is really important. When you add something to the gospel, it is an admission that what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection is not enough to give you the forgiveness of sins, right? In other words, I've got to help God out and add water, for example, right? It's an admission that what Jesus did isn't enough. You know what? I'm convinced, folks, that what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection is enough. He paid the price. It's paid in full. He even said that it is finished when he was on the cross. He paid for sins. Nothing else needs to be done. You don't need to do anything except accept that payment that he made, his death on the cross. Here's the third way believing in vain happens, putting your faith in an incorrect object. You know, faith is not a standalone concept. It's always in something, right? Faith always has an object. In this context that we're looking at in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the the object of faith is the gospel that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for our sins, right? And when a person puts their faith in that, as being enough for the forgiveness of sins, God gives them the power of God unto salvation. Well, how does believing in vain happen this way? Well, it happens when you change an element in the message, right? Let's say you change who the person of Jesus Christ is, and you say you didn't really rise from the dead, or you say he's really not God. When you make that kind of a change, it changes the whole message, And when you change the message, listen to me, you change the object of faith. And when you change the object of faith, when you put your faith in that changed object, it has no saving power. You see what I'm saying? And consequently, your faith is in vain. That's what he's talking about here. So Paul says, this is the gospel you accepted where you can find stability unless you didn't understand 
or unless you believed something else, right? Unless you believed in vain. Well, we see what believing in vain is. Let's talk about what believing is. Look over in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. We're going to also skip down to verses 20 through 22, but look at Romans 4, 3. Paul really gives us a good explanation of faith here in Romans 4, verse 3. And by the way, when you see that word believing in the Greek, in the verb form, it is the Greek word pistuo. Again, I'm not a Greek scholar, I just looked it up, all right? And all that word means is to be persuaded of something. We might term it to be convinced, right? So keep that in mind as we read this passage here. Look what he says, verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it, his believing God, was credited to him as righteousness. Look at verse 20, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Verse 21, really important here. And being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it, his being fully persuaded, it was also credited to him as righteousness. When he says fully persuaded there in verse 21, that is explaining or describing Abraham believing God stated there in verse 3, right? It is, it is like a, 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 a parallel here. That's all faith means is to be persuaded of something, right? And then, consequently, God credited righteousness to his account. Abraham believed God because he was convinced or fully persuaded that what God promised he would actually literally perform. And when it comes to believing the gospel message, folks, that's what it is. We are convinced that what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection is enough by itself. Boy, that's important. By itself to give us the forgiveness of sins. That's what some would say is saving faith, right? So to actually believe the gospel means that you are persuaded that it's true simply because it's true. Look at the content of the gospel real quickly here in verses 3 and 4. He says how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Notice the five points of the gospel message here are the elements of the gospel. We see in this gospel message who he is. It says Christ is died for our sins. We see what he did, that he died, was buried, and rose again. We see why I needed or why he did that. He died for our sins, it says. We see how I get it in this passage, too. It's simply by accepting it or believing that what he did is enough. And we see where it's found. Did you notice the only thing he says twice in this passage is it's according to the Scriptures. Let's talk about that first one for a minute. It says, Christ died for our sins, who he is. Well, Who is Jesus? Well, here's a snapshot of who Jesus is in the Bible. He is the Old Testament prophesied Messiah who was born of the virgin, who lived a sinless life while he was on earth, who died physically, bodily on the cross for our sins. It says he was buried. That proves he died. And on the third day, he rose physically, bodily from the grave. He is God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. He's fully God. He's fully man. He's the one and only way of salvation, and he's coming back again someday. In a nutshell, that's who Jesus Christ is. And when Paul says Christ here, that's who he's talking about. You can't subtract from that or add anything to that. That's who he is. You say, now wait a minute, Preston. The gospel verses here don't plainly say Jesus is God. That's true. It doesn't directly say it here in the passage, but it does in numerous other places in the Bible. But could someone be saved who denied that Jesus was God? That's the question. Well, if Jesus is simply a man and not actually God, could a person's faith in an ordinary man save him? No, it couldn't. 
Because that ordinary man you're putting your faith in needs saving just like every other ordinary man, right? Jesus is not an ordinary man. He is God in the flesh. And as such, he's the only one who could go to the cross and pay the the perfect price for sin that God required. And he did it. Jesus was the only one who could pay for our sins. So we see who he is. Also, we see what he did and why I need it. It says he, he died for our sins. Boy, I love that word for, uh, and I'm thankful for it. He, that means on behalf of. He died in my place. I'm the guilty one. He died in your place. He died for our sins. Since he died for our sins, it's understood that we are sinners, right? And the Bible is clear on this, that, that we're all sinners. You know how we can also see this in everyday life? How many of you have children? You ever have to teach them to sin? No, you didn't, did you? Because they're little sinners, right? How many of you had to be taught to sin? I didn't either. In fact, we have to be taught the opposite, don't we? Don't sin. We naturally sin. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden that day, folks, they passed down to their children what they had. What did they have? Sin. And you pass down to your children what you have, and that's sin. And when Jesus went to the cross and he died on that cross, he paid the price. In fact, the only payment for sin that God would accept because it's perfect. And when we believe that, that what he did is enough, he gives us then his righteousness. He deposits that into our account. So we see why we need what he did. We see what he did, but also we see how I get it. It's simply by accepting by faith that what he did is enough to give me the forgiveness of sins. And we see where it's found. You you notice the only thing he said there twice was according to the Scriptures. You know, I've wondered, why would he say that here? I mean, isn't the point of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins? Why, Why say this according to the Scriptures here, much less twice? Well, Paul's stating his authority here. This is from God, right? This is not from man. So part of accepting the gospel message is accepting that this message is from God. It's not man-made, right? And the trustworthiness of the source of the gospel message is inextricable, inextricable from the facts of the saving message itself. Why? Because it is a message in the Bible. There's a general acceptance that the Scripture is from God, just like the message, the saving message, is from God. Because after all, can you really say you're persuaded that the gospel is true even though it comes from a book that you think is mythical? You can't, can you? No, there has to be a general acceptance that this is a message from God. Proclaiming the gospel. Boy, this is our mission as believers. How many of you have at least one unbeliever in your life? Okay. Now, someone probably came to mind when I asked you that. You know what I'd like you to to do starting today? Will you pray for them? Here's what I encourage you to pray for them. Pray for them by name. Ask that they would pray that they would hear, understand, and believe the gospel message for salvation. Do you get that? Pray that they would hear, understand, and believe the gospel message for salvation. Will you start praying for them today? Notice in closing here what's not included in the gospel. Did you notice that he didn't say anything about baptism or joining a church or good deeds or turning over new leaf or making some kind of commitment to God or surrendering your life to him or praying some kind of prayer? He didn't say, he didn't mention any of those things. You know why? Because look over in Hebrews 9.22. Here's a verse you ought to memorize. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That's why nothing else is mentioned here. Because nothing else died on the cross for your sins. Right? In fact, Hebrews 9.22 raises a question for anything anybody says you have to do 
to be saved. In fact, I've got a chart here for you that compares that verse and asks that question of several activities. I just want to take a couple before to close here. The question that, the two questions that come from Hebrews 9.22 for any ritual or good work that someone says you have to do to be saved is this. Is there the shedding of blood involved with that activity or ritual? Okay, can there then be the forgiveness of sins from that? Let me take just a couple of them here, okay, and then we'll be done. Water baptism. Is there the shedding of blood involved in water baptism? Hopefully not, right? I mean, we're not going to have a bloody baptistry. No, there, no, there isn't. There isn't the shedding of blood involved in water baptism, let me assure you, okay? Can there be the forgiveness of sins in water baptism? No. And we don't believe that, right? How about joining a church? Is there the shedding of blood involved in joining a church? Hopefully not. If there is, you need to find another church, right? No, there isn't the shedding of blood involved in joining a church. So there can't be the forgiveness of sins there. How about repentance? Let me take this one for just a minute, okay? I'm going to camp out here for just a second. With repentance, some people say you've got to repent of all of your sins as if you've got to reform yourself. And then accept Jesus as your Savior, and you can be saved. Let's take this for just a minute, all right? If you have to repent of all of your sins, whatever that means, how many of you can remember all your sins from last week? How about from when you were a teenager? You can't. If you can't remember them all, how can you possibly repent of them, whatever that means? You know what the... The word translated repent in the New Testament is, it's the Greek word metanoia. It means to change your mind. You know how it happens in relation to getting saved? Because some people say, Preston, you don't believe in repentance. Oh, yes, I do. You know what repentance means in relation to getting saved? It means changing your mind. You know, everybody, everybody, before they believe the gospel for salvation, believes something else good works or being a good person, whatever, okay? When they change their mind and say, this is not right, the gospel is right, I believe that. That is repenting. And everybody repents to get saved, right? But it's not a reforming. It is simply changing your mind and believing what's true. That's what biblical repentance is. And here's specifically what you change your mind and accept. That what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection is enough by itself to give you the forgiveness of sins. And everybody, everybody has to change their mind and accept that to be saved. So my question for you is, what do you believe today? You know, my youth minister said something a long time ago I'll never forget. He said, eternity is too long to be wrong. It is, isn't it? It's too long to be wrong. What do you believe today? I hope you'll at least consider accepting that what Jesus did is enough. He paid the price for sin. Just accept the payment made. Will you consider that at least? Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful to you that Jesus paid the price for sins. All sins have been paid for. All we need to do to have that payment applied to our account is simply believe that what was done on the cross and resurrection is enough to pay even for my sin. And I thank you, Lord, that it is. It is enough. What you've done is enough. And you've taken care of that. It's my prayer today that some, maybe for the first time, realize their faith's in doing something. That they just can't believe you don't have to do something. Well, Lord, let them see today that they just accept what's done. A lot was done to pay for sin. You did a great, enormous thing paying for our sin. And we're grateful to you for that. May those who don't see that today, please, Lord, It's our prayer, it's my prayer, 
that they would see, understand, and believe that what you've done is enough to give them the forgiveness of sins for every human being needs the forgiveness of sins. And we thank you, Lord, that you have done what was required on our behalf. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Wow, we get the cart before the horse so often, don't we? That's a really important list that we saw up there. A lot of important things that we need to do. We just don't do them in order to be saved. I saw a great meme yesterday. I think it was on, or maybe it was this morning on Instagram. It said, We are all absolutely saved by works. They're just not our works. They're the works of Jesus. Jesus did everything necessary for salvation. And so I want to echo Preston's invitation there. If you feel far from God, if you are far from God today, if you have been trusting in yourself, if you have... uh, just maybe just felt overwhelmed with your sin. That may have been what brought you here. Maybe while you're watching online, you feel overwhelmed with your sin. Jesus is the only solution for your sin. You're not going to be able to reform yourself and then come to Jesus. You just can't. We don't have that in us. We have to have the Holy Spirit to draw us to repentance and to lead us to fully trust in Jesus And so we want to give you the opportunity to do that now. I want to invite you, if you will, just to stand. We're going to have a time of invitation. You see on the screen there the various ways you can respond in worship. The most important response you can give, truly, before any of the others, is for your salvation. Put your trust in Jesus today, understanding that he is the only way that you can get your life together. He is the only way that you can have hope for eternal life. Do that today. Now, the way we respond in worship here is uh, in a couple of ways. You can come right here and you can talk to me about any of those things that are up there on the screen. And I'll be happy to pray with you and I'll be happy to to answer any questions that you have. Um, But I'm going to take you over to our next steps area, which is right outside these doors over here to my left and to your right. I would encourage you, if you don't feel comfortable getting up in front of everybody, go straight to those doors. You can even go out the back and make your way around to the next steps area. If you're in the balcony, just go downstairs. Make your way to our next steps area. We have counselors there that will talk to you about what it means to be saved. They'll make sure you understand the gospel. If you need to make one of these other decisions, baptism, maybe the Lord's calling you to ministry. If, if, if God's leading you to join this church, if you need, just need somebody to pray for you, they can handle that too. But don't leave here without getting things right with the Lord. Brother John's going to lead us in one last song. We invite you to sing, but more than that, we invite you to respond. Do whatever it is that the Lord is calling you to do. And to follow Jesus, I have decided to follow When peace like a river attendeth my way When sorrows like sea
This live stream has been made possible by contributions to Ellendale Baptist Church and from viewers like you. Thank you so much for your support.